Hello, I just wanted to make a quick video to go through some of the notes that we were talking about yesterday. Um, I will send you these shortly as well um, with a video, but I just sort of wanted to go through stuff because it doesn't really make much sense unless someone's describing it. So uh, in these notes, the first thing we discussed was sort of the original sort of type fuzzing. So this was, you know, back of what people used to do in the 1990s and still do. So you hear tools like Zuff um, and sort of others that can do this. Or if you're just going to make a really rudimentary Python script that just sends data. So I said last night on the right, we have a server. This is some sort of HTTP server. Um, and you have some sort of clients. This will be a web browser, your Apache server, say. And yeah, I mean, in the second one here, you can see that there's, um, you make these get requests. So the client will do a TCP connection to port 80 or port 443 if it's encrypted. Once that TCP connection is set up, this server will be expecting some data to be delivered on that socket. It will send some request like this, get index.php http slash 1.1. This client will send this text over that TCP connection from the client to the server over the internet. And then what it'll expect back is this server will send a web page in the other direction um, with some like codes like you know uh, 200 success or 200 OK, and will send a web page in the other direction. You know, typically if you put it in simple terms, something like just basic HTML. That's how a web server works. So, and when people originally started fuzzing these web servers, what they would do is they would create some sort of pseudo client that would open a basic TCP connection to a web server and instead of saying get index.php they would just replace this index.php with a web page that doesn't exist for instance or lots of lots of A's or really long strings and funny characters like at symbols and everything else. Now within the standard H within the HTTP standard itself the server shouldn't respond to you know, malformed requests, but just because the standard says that it shouldn't, ref you know, respond to malformed requests or perform something a bit funny, depending on the code quality within the server itself, it could crash in cases like Heartbleed. It can send back um, people's, you know, it would read past uh, the buffer in memory and would start sending uh, adjacent memory blocks or adjacent chunk blocks in the heap back to the client, even though it's not supposed to. And some of those things would um, sort of have people's passwords in them so that was the original sort of fuzzing all you would do is you just send a bunch of data to the server and hope it cla it crashes and you, over here you would have these things called mutators that would you know use intelligence and sort of different methodologies for generating the bit flips generating the arithmetic in, you know operations to try and trigger new code traces to be executed but it was very dumb and you're just sending blocks of data at the server it's completely random so there's absolutely no chance that you'll well i mean eventually you will theoretically but there's no chance that in you know a, a realistic number period of time you're going to hit anything that even the server means there's a chance that if i just send keep sending data you know, there's only a small functionality that rejects the request because it's malformed. And if I always send only a malformed request in, I don't hit that bug that's, you know, deeper down into the software that might be to do with, you know, JSON processing. It'll just throw it away at the beginning. So that was the sort of flaw of this basic fuzzing. People still use it. Um, can be quite effective, especially if you can understand a bit of the grammar. There's a tool called Redamza, and I hate to say that's a basic fuzzer, but it, it's a it's a really good mutation engine. It can do stuff like this really, really well. So the next thing, the sort of that we went on to with the notes was, um, I guess it was called evolutionary or you know generational based fuzzing. I know, like people mix and match the terms all the time. So what you would do is instead of the first time where you just send random bits of data at the server, the second time you would specify a configuration file that would dictate exactly which bits of the standard you want to mutate and exactly which bits of the standard you don't want to mutate. So in this instance, we've got um, a get request, which is a string. So we could say, um, always make, we want to mutate this around or we want to swap this around. We want to uh, change what the word is. So here it's get, it could be post as well because that's another HTTP verb that people, the web servers recognize. Then you could do get and you could swap maybe the letters, maybe you put some sort of uh, different symbols in here, but ultimately you're only iterating these verbs because that should, instead of in this case where we're just sending random data or a get request, in this case we're now testing the get parameters and now testing the post parameters. And you describe these configuration files. And the same here, we say get string, you're allowed to mutate the string. We say there always has to be a space in there because part of the HTTP standard dictates there must be a space. Then again, we have the web page requested, string.h, uh, sorry, another string. 
um, another space string for this HTTP we'll keep the slash and then we say that there's a, a number here or, or a number you know a period and a number and you this is your fuzzers like defensix things like peach things like sully and things like boofers there's lots of them out there but essentially you give a configuration file it's a bit more work up front but you give a configuration file describing exactly what's in these locations say a string or a number or you know a, a space or you know a dash you can you can set it so it doesn't mutate it or doesn't mutate it you might want to change the value of this bit here during the fuzz and not change this value here it's completely up to you and you can specify that in the configuration file so instead of working from nothing as it was happening in the first we're just sending random bits of data now in this sort of more evolutionary generational based approach we give it a configuration file and say go off and do whatever you can to sort of um, iterate through it and then the third type of fuzzing that I sort of uh, sort of this is where this is what we were sort of digging into is looking at programs as actual code blocks so if you guys have ever opened up something like IDA or you know binary ninja as uh, I'll quickly load it up on my screen and then show you you will get a program so that everything in here is some sort of program and you'll get sort of these blocks and one of the things I alluded to yesterday is that let's say for instance if I let me grab my pen Sorry about that. Let's say, for instance, that this side here, if this is a valid, let's say this is an XML um, library, if this is a valid XML file, this will be the case where it's a valid file. And this, the left hand side, will be the error case. So everywhere you see red, just think of it's, you know, this is a malformed XML file, so it's rejecting it. And everywhere it's green is a valid XML file, and it's accepting it. And in this circumstance, this program's job is to read this XML file. If it's a valid XML file, it goes down this path of the program blocks. Each one of these things here will be like an if statement or a comparison statement at assembly. Down here, it's an invalid XML file. And what I said is AFL does is it, it captures the output of the preprocessor during the compilation step. And it will put a bit of code, actually technically a bit of code here, but it's essentially an edge detection monitor. And put a bit of code right at the beginning of the block here, right at the beginning of the block here, right at the beginning of the block here, right at the beginning of the block here. And it will detect which ones of these blocks it's gone through. And a path where, let's say a valid path, is this, 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 and then exits the program, is a different path taken to this, 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 when it's an invalid path. And AFL can record this because it has a bit of sort of instrumentated instrumentation code on the on the sort of beginning of these basic blocks and is able to record these two different paths, which means if I change something in the file over here and it because I changed something in the file, it caused the program to now trace down this path, then I know something about what I changed in that file is significant or insignificant. Now, I could have, it could have been something you know really basic, like I've swapped all of the A's in this file to be B's in the file. I don't necessarily know which B in the file has, you know, has made that change. It could only be one. It could be all of them. I don't know. But the important thing is, is that this allows a lot more code coverage, whether or not it's an invalid case or a valid case, and allows you to dig much further down in the code. And this is like a big, th this was sort of, I can't, I don't want to pronounce the name because I don't, I can't pronounce it properly, but this was developed by a guy in Google, um, sort of this type of thing, and absolutely revolutionized fuzzing. And this is, you know, how Microsoft and Google's and Amazon's of the world really do it. And this is one of like integrating this into your actual um, continuous integration, continuous development life cycle is powerful. People, like I said before, people use unit tests to, you know, try and exceed the boundaries of what they think is sensible. But fuzz testing does all of that for you and more. You know, you still need unit tests. I'm not advocating getting rid of unit tests. But for critical bits of code, if you're really worried about them, parsing functions, things that are exposed to the front end web server, you know, JavaScript functions that have some sort of, you know, really critical functionality. The same with C++, Java you know, go, rust, anything. You can use fuzzing to test and exceed the bounds. You want to detect these zero-day bugs that ex people like me are finding in your products before you make it out of production. And this is one, a really good method for doing it. And there's lots of really good open source tools out there that do this all for you and automate it. Okay. Uh, so now we're on to AFL. Um, 
so what I was saying with AFL is AFL does all of this instrumentation that I was discussing before. Um, and like I said, you get a program. In this case, we were looking at duct tape because I fuzzed this a couple of years ago and found a bunch of bugs in it. Um, what you want to do is you want to compile duct tape under AFL uh, GCC or, or, or AFL Clang Fast now as the default or AL, AFL Clang Fast++ plus 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 for C++ plus plus code. Instrument it. So you perform all of these. So that, that will add all this bit of instrumentation onto this code within duct tape. So just pretend, sorry, just pretend that this here is actually duct tape itself and it's got all these bits of instrumentation code and this file is some sort of JavaScript file we uh, are running. I forgot to mention that duct tape is a JavaScript engine processor. I think it's meant to be really small and I see it a lot in sort of IoT more embedded devices if they require JavaScript processing. Um, really small scale thing. So here we've got these test cases and these test cases can just be, you know, a file of all zeros, um, valid JavaScript, invalid JavaScript. But basically, like I said, AFL compiler will run, uh, sorry, will compile duct tape to have the instrumentation as we described in the previous um, notes. And then what you do is AFL will have a test case, read that test case in, will start duct tape running. It actually uses something called a fork serve that I'll describe next week, but not this week. Sends this test case in, will send the test case to duct tape in some sort of wrapper. It, this duct tape will read that test case and, and, and evaluate which path it's taken on the left or the right hand side and whether or not it's caused a crash or a bug. If it has, and you know, it generates a test new a new path. It records that path in uh, what's called using the Bloom filter, um, but basically a big database of where it's gone, or or I wouldn't say a database, an an area in memory that it records where it's gone. Then it moves on to B. So it's run the first test case. It's got the trace of that execution. Moves on to um, test case number B. B gets read into AFL, pumped into duct tape. Let's say it executes exactly the same path as it did the first time. Nothing in B, even though we changed stuff, was significant enough to perform another, you know, another, another path or, or generate a new path through the code. Then let's say we enter a bunch of, you know, case Z. We've done lots, and then let's say we get to case Z. And then in this case, when it reads in the file, it sends it to duct tape, and a new path is executed based on the instrumentation recording we've had previously. We know that this file here was significant enough to do something different from A, B, which means that we know something in here has generated new code. And if, if that causes a crash or one of our mutations causes a crash, fantastic, we can save it. We can do more analysis um, sort of on it later by corpus reduction or test case reduction, do some sort of dynamic instrumentation, do some sort of debugging on it to really dig down and see what the problem is. And hopefully it's a zero day bug that we can exploit. I also explained a bit about the compilation process. Um, I, I didn't mention this yesterday because I couldn't remember it. So you have typical compilers such as GCC or Clang. Um, Clang is C Lang, it's part of the LLVA framework, and G is the new C, C compiler. And you know, you'd have some sort of source code file, let's say this is our source code file, um, and you type GCC and it outputs an object file that you can execute. The same with Clang as well. So what AFL so this is the compilation process. So we have step one. You write a source code file. Sometimes you'll see things like import statements in Python requiring JavaScript, uh, and you'll see things like include in C. Now I'm going to keep this basic, and you know I I don't mean to offend people by what I'm going to say because like it's too complicated to explain. But I'm going to just think of import statements, require statements, and you know include statements as being the same thing. They're not like there's a lot of nuances there and there's a lot of complexities. But for all intensive purposes, you're going to get some external code and running it. We're sticking to C because C is actually the most simple way of describing this process. But this is essentially what happens. You have some sort of source code file, you know, let's say main.c, and you type in this command to compile it. The first thing it will do is called is something called pre-processing. It'll go and find the print.h, or I mean the actual technical one is the stdio.h, but let's say it's what there's a function a header file called print.h, it will go and find that print.h file and literally just copies it, the whole file, and places it at the front of this main C. So you've got this really big object file, this really big pre-processed file, that just includes all of these you know, definitions or function prototypes, and just tacks it on the front of this main.c source code file. The next step is it will lex and parse all of this code, build what's called an abstract syntax tree, 
and it will convert all of this entire object, including all of the H files, into an object file. So I've put main.o. Um, object files are basically the precursor to sort of fully executable files. So in this instance, the main.o file is just pure machine instructions. Now there's going to be lots of problems because, you know, even though we've included the descriptions of what the functions are, we haven't actually included the functions here yet. Um, but we will sort of in the next step. So, you know, step one, you do the pre-processing. I like to call this compile actual because this is the actual bit where, you know, you get generate the abstract syntax trees and you generate the parse trees and you actually generate the machine code. Remember, this is the machine code from the source code file after we've pre-processed it. Now, the final step in the process is that even though we've, you know, included the descriptions for, you know, print functions, we haven't actually copied the print function libraries in. So you'll see this print.so down here. Sorry for my handwriting. I will send these notes on as well. But this is going to live somewhere on your system. This is when, you know, you do the, you know, include bit or you do import in another library or you do require. But essentially what it's going to do during this link step, it's going to go and find that code and it's going to either statically copy that code and compile it with your end, end output binary or it's going to give a little referral so if you if you have some sort of print function, you've got two options. You can either physically copy the print code in to the binary itself. It makes the binary a bit bigger, but you can physically copy it, and that's called static linking. Or what you can do is on your system is this is where you have libraries installed and DLL installed, right? So instead of you needing to like hook around or you know these giant sort of executable files with all the libraries in them, what it does is when it executes, it goes into the system, like, you know, Windows System 32 or, you know, slash home, no, not slash home, so slash, slash slash lib on Linux or something like that, or slash local lib, and it'll go find these sort of source code files or these shared objects, and then it will pass control over to the print function in this, and then return uh, back here. But like I said, AFL basically only intercepts this little bit of process here. And what it does is every time there's a, a an instruction here, like an if statement or a while statement or another statement, and as it gets compiled, if it sees a comparison function or it sees like something that can change the execution over here, it will add a little bit of code during this compilation step. And then this here will have that bit of code or instrumentation um, within this object file, which then gets linked together. And that's essentially what AFL um, G++ is doing, or C++. So down here I've written AFL GCC, AFL Clang. It's actually AFL Clang fast these days. But that's essentially what it's doing. During this compilation process, step one, you want to compile the code under AFL. You have this main C file, injects a bunch of code into the stream here, links all of the stuff together, um, and then it's ready for fuzzing. So that's just to, that's just to add the instrumentation. I mean, I showed you all of that um, sort of above um, sort of last night, so I won't get into it, but sort of I just want to go over the notes. The next thing we spoke about related to the notes was the hangs and crashes. So I said um, about programs and Turing machines would be the more correct term, are able to... Uh, it's, it's impossible for a program to tell whether or not another program is going to run forever or stop or halt as it's called it, it it works for trivial programs and you can do it in some some circumstances however alan Turing proved that this generally is impossible which means it's impossible for afl in a general sense to be able to tell whether or not any program is going to ever crash or you know it's going to crash or it's going to stop or it's going to loop forever so what happens is it distinguishes um, what's called loops, and it calls them hangs and crashes. If if the if the execution takes maybe you know two seconds too long, it'll say it's a loop. It might not. It might end after three seconds. But AFL has chosen you know whatever sort of parameters it's chosen for this. I think it's around two seconds. I can't remember for sure. Two hundred milliseconds. I really can't remember for sure. And whether or not it's crashed or stopped. Either case, it could be valid. So, you know, if it stops early because there's some sort of weird exception, that could be a valid bug. We don't know what's triggered that. If there's a crash, you know, it's a seg fault or something like that, that's really interesting to us because that, that makes, you know, I mean, that, that proves that it's some sort of, what something over here, whether or not we've influenced it or, you know, it's just been another sort of bug, has influenced it to cause a segmentation fault. It could be a heap buffer overflow, an overread, null pointer dereference, you know, heap overflow, something else that over here 
that's happened, which is really interesting. But at the same time, we could have found a new way to do an infinite loop. Now, infinite loops, you know, are valid, like things that people sort of don't consider. Your kernel, your Windows kernel, is an infinite loop. It sits there in the scheduler, has a little process that keeps running um, and telling the process to, the, or the cause of the processor to sleep for a certain amount of time because there's nothing ready to process yet. But at the end of the day, when you turn your computer on, it doesn't do one thing and then turn off again. It sits there forever. And the only way it can sit there forever is because it's in an infinite loop waiting for more input. And that's the whole idea of the paradigm of you know, multi, um, multitasking, right, or multi-process computing, is you're able to perform multiple things. And it can only do that because the operating system at this level is managing it in an infinite loop. So it could be valid, it could be invalid. But there's a really important thing that I showed you last night, is that if you've got any infinite valid infinite loops in your code, you'll have to get rid of them, because the way AFL works and the way, the way fuzzing works is it wants one execution to trace, and then it can go back and iterate that trace and just go do another trace, go back and iterate and trace. If it doesn't ever get to the end of the loop, you can mess around with it in persistence mode, which I'll go into next, next week. But at, at a basic level, if you don't do this, you know, get rid of these infinite loops in the code, it will just get really confused and think everything's an infinite loop, which isn't necessarily a good idea. And the final bit, um, I like I like to call this uh, hill hill climbing, just because I sort of started out my career in a biometrics background. But there's really cool effects, and I think I think the article was called "How to Pull JPEGs Out of Thin Air Using AFL." Now, what's really interesting, and you've got to think about it, is AFL and these other instrumented fuzzers are all about executing as much code within the library as possible. And the way that you get, say, a xml library to execute code or execute as much code as possible is by giving it a valid xml file because if you had a you know an xml library that was doing parsing and you gave it an invalid xml file it will just tell you to go away straight away let's say that here is the program right and it says you know this is a you know an xml reader or lib xml or whatever it is and i give it what i say is an xml file and it looks at my file and goes your file is too small then what it's going to do is it's just going to go straight to like an exit condition it's going to go no error too small which means if we give it a bigger file, it'll pass that first check of, let's say, a size check and get to a second check, which means we've actually progressed down here in the execution tree. So just imagine all of these nodes here, as I showed before, are the basic blocks in the programming, and we've got bits of instrumentation on all of these edges. So this is a graph, by the way. And um, in sort of graph theory, you, uh, graphs are basically what are called vertexes or vertices and edges. Everywhere you see a round loop or a box or something, that's a node or a vertex. Everywhere you've got a line, that's an edge. So like I said before, AFL will instrument these edges or instrument these like code execution paths. And then if I give it an, an invalid XML file, it'll tell me to go away if the file's too small, say. But if I give it a file that's big enough, it'll execute an extra, it'll execute down this edge here and execute this path and it'll have done something different. So what it's gonna do next is I give it another XML file. The file's big enough. This time, it was an invalid XML file, so it told me to go away again. But either way, I've generated a new, I know, I've jumped to a new node, I've generated a new code block, or I've executed a new code block. Next time around, what I'm going to do, send in a new XML file. Is it the correct size? Yes. Is it, you know, does it begin with an X or a bracket? Yes. It does it, is it followed by, you know, an, an M? Because that's what XML is, right? You want an X and then an M file? No, it doesn't follow by an M. Right, go away. But each time we're sort of progressively executing more code. And the best way to get a XML library to actually execute code is by giving it valid XML files. Which means if we essentially start from nothing and we can trace the execution, and our goal is to generate as much um, sort of code as possible or, or generate as many paths as possible, What's going to happen is I can start from a file with all zeros that doesn't look anything like a valid XML file, and then AFL will learn which type of file executes the most, the most amount of paths through this program. And the, mo the only type of format that's going to generate the most amount of paths through you know, an XML parser, in this case, is going to be a valid XML file. So AFL is essentially learning, based on some sort of scoring system, whether or not an XML file is you know, to generate an XML file or to not generate an XML file. And this is the same with PNG files. It's the same with um, you know, JPEG files. Yeah, it's a very slow process if you start from nothing. But I just wanted to make the point that actually, you know, it can generate xml files out of thin air and this is one of these sort of if you can if you can understand why it does this you sort of understand the point of instrumented fuzzing and what it means to do it properly